Well, um, good evening, everyone, and welcome to PNP Live. I'm Brad Graham, the co-owner of Politics and Prose, along with my wife, Lisa Muscatine. And we have three very smart, very engaging Stanford professors here this evening to talk about their new book, System Error, where big tech went wrong and how we can reboot. And they're going to be in conversation with a political figure and commentator whom many of you no doubt know, uh, Julian Castro. A couple of brief housekeeping notes first, though. To post a question at any point during the discussion, just click on the Q&A button at the bottom of the page. And in the chat column, you'll find a link for purchasing copies of System Error. So who are the three thoughtful guys here from Stanford? One's a philosopher, another is a technologist, and the third has government policymaking experience. Now, Rob Reich is the philosopher and leader of the University Center for Ethics and Society, an institute for human-centered artificial intelligence. He's the author of several previous books on philanthropy and education, and he's received multiple teaching awards. Mehran Sahami is a computer science professor who once worked for Google during the startup days uh, when he helped invent email spam filtering technology. At Stanford, he teaches a large introduction to computer science course and led the redesign of the undergraduate computer science curriculum. Jer Jeremy Weinstein is a professor of political science. He's also spent time in government, serving in the Obama administration, first on the National Security Council staff, and then at the United Nations as chief of staff and later deputy to Ambassador Samantha Power. Plus, he's the author of a couple of previous books on insurgent violence and collective action. Several years ago, Rob, Meron, and Jeremy joined forces to develop and teach a course on technology, policy, and ethics that quickly became one of the most popular classes on campus. The idea was to catch the, the next generation of technologists and policymakers while they're still in school and get them to focus on the ramifications of the systems and, and products and, and policies they'd be uh, developing and, and marketing and, um, and, and coming up with. Uh, that course, which led to, to the book they've written, was indicative of a heightened interest in ethical thinking among technologists, which comes against the background of growing public concern about the enormous concentration of power in the hands of tech companies and the role technology has played in shaping our lives. That role, of, of course, has been both good and not so good. Uh, for, um, um, for all the ease, comfort, and convenience that tech firms have brought, they also are being blamed for facilitating the spread of disinformation and hate, for, um, uh, for collecting too much personal data about us, for callously putting people out of work, and for dangerously distorting markets. In System Error, the three Stanford professors look at, at big tech, its obsession with optimization and efficiency, and how that focus has affected our lives, often at the expense of such other values as fairness, privacy, autonomy, and equality, all vital to maintaining a democratic society. Their book also offers some solutions on what can be done to control technology instead of letting it control us. Now, moderating this evening's discussion, as I mentioned at the outset, will be Julian Castro, who served as uh, Secretary of Housing and Urban Development in the Obama administration, and before that, as mayor of San Antonio. He also, of course, uh, ran for president the last time around, and since then has launched a political action committee, People First Future, to help elect progressive candidates. Additionally, he hosts a podcast, Our America with Julian Castro, and he serves as a political analyst on NBC and MSNBC. Uh, so gentlemen, screen is yours. All right, thank you so much, Brad, and thank you to Politics and Pros for hosting us uh, this evening. Uh, of course, all of us wish that uh, we could be doing a live in-person ev event. Politics and Pros is such an institution in DC and beyond, uh, but we know that we'll return to that soon. The next best thing, though, and we're going to have a wonderful time tonight, is to get to do this virtually. And so I just want to say thanks to everybody who's joining us 
uh, tonight. I think you're in for a real treat. You heard the introductions uh, of Rob, Maron, and Jeremy, all of them fantastic, uh, brilliant Stanford professors uh, who have written this very timely book called System Error, Where Big Tech Went Wrong and How We Can Reboot. Uh, all of us are familiar, especially in recent years, with so many different issues that have bubbled up uh, at the intersection of technology, uh, policy, and ethics. And maybe the best place to start, uh, y'all, is um, you're all there on campus at Stanford. Uh, go Cardinal, Stanford 96, and so I'm happy to be a part of this. But you're all there, uh, all of you super accomplished in your own right. Uh, one of you, as Brad mentioned, a philosopher, the other a technologist, the other uh, a public policy scholar and practitioner. Um, talk to me about uh, how you got the idea for collaborating on this book in the first place, because it's not a collaboration that you see too often across the kind of disciplinary lines uh, that y'all represent. Maybe I'll hop in and start. We, we have different motivations that brought us together. So it's not all one and the same, but you know, for, for people who are thinking about um, buying the book, reading the book, you might wonder how on earth does a group of three people, a philosopher, a technologist, a policymaker come together and write in a single voice? And as you know, the answer to that is, it came from the fact that we were teaching together for a couple of years and we got to know each other really well through that and, and developed, if not a single view about everything, at least a common framework for thinking about the issue of big tech and the grab it has um, in many respects over, over our lives. So for me, the philosopher, um, you know, in a way which uh, uh, there was a kind of hand wringing at the university a, a decade ago, where we witnessed anyone who was on campus, the great migration of undergraduate students away from the humanities and social sciences to, to make computer science the largest major on campus, um, the biggest major for men, the biggest major for women. And it became this juggernaut. And I, in particular, partly was just curious as a, as a teacher, what's going on over there that people are flocking over there in record numbers? Um, and I learned, of course, uh, Maron uh, uh, was you know, an extraordinary presence in the classroom and completely changed the curriculum in a way that was a, a magnet for people. And then I also thought to myself, as the bloom was coming off the rose of Silicon Valley, uh, the university, which is responsible perhaps more than any other place in the world for having created the, the technology revolution that's affected us all, now should have to come to terms itself with the, the downsides of, of what that technological revolution has wrought. And so we had better prepare a new generation of students to take on board these ethical and social dimensions of their extraordinary technical skills that have so changed the world. Uh, and, and, Go ahead, Julian. Uh, yeah, I, and Jeremy, I mean, you uh, teach public policy. Uh, you've been at Stanford, I think, since 2015. But before then, as was mentioned, uh, you served in the Obama administration. Um, you know, the, I don't know if you want to say the knock on Silicon Valley, uh, um, certainly I think in the beginning with Microsoft, um, but today maybe there's a more nuanced conversation to be had. But the line about Silicon Valley for the longest time was that it, it really did not participate with Washington in a conversation um, uh, about the industry and trying to, you know, wanted to be left alone. Uh, we talked about sort of the, the genesis of your collaboration but how did you see the importance of participating in this from a public policy perspective? So thanks, thanks for the question. You know, for me, the motivation for getting involved in this effort was when I came back to Stanford from the Obama administration, I'd really been struck by just the tremendous gulf between those people who were responsible for governing a society that was being transformed by technology and those who actually understood technology. And you know, when both of us were in Washington in the second Obama term, there was still a fascination with Silicon Valley, still kind of rose colored glasses about what technology might mean for our society. But we had a number of developments over the course of the second term. Think for example, about the debates around end-to-end -end encryption uh, and the back door uh, that was desired by some folks in government in order to have access to information in the iPhone in order to protect citizens from terrorism or the reality when we had 
uh, cyber hack of Sony, the first major hack of, a, of an American company uh, that could credibly be linked to overseas state or state supported actors. These were moments at which one had to really reckon with the fact that we need a set of policymakers who are deeply attuned to technology and the way that technology works. But we also need a set of technologists who aren't driven primarily by the bottom line of their companies, but are thinking about the public interest. That is, how do we harness the benefits of technology, but also mitigate the harms with an eye towards something that's different than a corporate bottom line? And so when I came back to Stanford, the goal was really to connect with Rob and Maron and think about how, as educators, we could really engage in this conversation. But what was clear to me is that the challenge was not only for technologists, but also to shape those people who see themselves as politicians and policymakers in the future. Because when you peel back the onion and you think about why are we in a position now with extremely concentrated power in the hands of a small number of tech companies, with enormous externalities from those technologies that are affecting society writ large, you can't ignore the fact that our politicians have played a critical role in enabling that concentration of power. And it dates back to the mid to late 1990s and the desire of the Clinton and Gore administration to really pave the way to the information superhighway. And through a set of deliberate legislative proposals implemented by Congress and regulatory policies adopted by the executive branch, it really paved the way for the moment that we find ourselves now. So it wasn't just that Washington was uninterested, uh, or it wasn't just that the tech companies were uninterested in engaging Washington. It was that Washington basically showed deliberate indifference to the tech industry. And you, say, through, and you would say ignorance also on the part of a lot of these policymakers that just don't understand, you know, that's not their thing, so to speak. So, so we definitely hear the stories of, of ignorance and those get a lot of attention in the Twitter sphere. But I'd say that there was also a strategic choice made by policymakers in the 1990s to construct what was called a regulatory oasis. And the idea was that if we're gonna win this race to the information superhighway, we should basically free tech companies of any constraints. And what has happened in the meantime, you know, is basically the accumulation of evidence over time that the incentives that technology companies have to build products that scale quickly and increase their revenue sources generates negative externalities that affect all of us. And it was only in the last few years that Washington woke up to that challenge. Well, and Jeremy, you mentioned um, technologists who are able to put the public interests above the bottom line. And you know, I think about that and I think of Meron, uh, uh, you're the, our third author uh, now, and, in just a full disclosure, I, I have to say uh, that I've known Meron now, I think, since the fall of 1992, because Meron was my RA uh, in Soto, the dorm at Stanford, and then he was the RF when I was an RA in Naranja, the dorm in Lagunita at Stanford, and uh, you know, I have very fond memories of those times, uh, but uh, Meron, you and I have known each other for a long, almost 30 years now. Uh, I know that you've always had that view of the public interest. At the same time, you've had a very accomplished career, uh, as, was, as Brad mentioned, early on at Google. Uh, you're involved in venture capital efforts now. So uh, in terms of this collaboration, how did you see your role as a technologist in the perspective that you're bringing to it? Well, thanks for the history, Julian. And one thing I also have to say, too, is, you know, when people, you know, find out that we've known each other for a long time and they ask, you know, uh, Julian, you know, is he the real deal? And I say, absolutely. He has been that person, you know, for the entire time I've known him. And he really cares about making an impact for everyone. Um, and I think that's one of the messages of the book is that, you know, what we've seen in the last 15 years or so, I mean, some people might actually be surprised to hear that about 20 years ago, enrollments in computer science were actually plummeting. And what happened starting about 15 years ago is we started to see those numbers go up because students really saw the power of technology and how it could make a difference in the world. And what we've seen more recently is that there's these effects that happen at scale, and especially when we try to automate more of the world, and we find out that there's bias in things like automated decision-making systems. We find out that when you collect enough data, you really start to infringe on people's privacy rights, even though you know a smaller amount of data may not have been so bad. We see the 
effect in elections with things like the pollution of our information ecosystem. And so, you know, being at Stanford, there was as a technologist, you know, as, along with the rest of the faculty, this real feeling of responsibility that we helped, you know, in historically birth and develop Silicon Valley. And so we have a responsibility now to help chart a better path forward. And part of that involves, you know, teaching and our students to try to think about the next generation. Part of it involves also been doing a class for, you know, practicing technologists and executives in Silicon Valley. But I think a big part of it too is recognizing that there's a lot of people who've worked in this area who came before us, who did some really pioneering and groundbreaking work. And we try to lift their voices in the book as well to show that really, if we wanna to get to solutions that are collectively good for everyone, what we really need is a diverse set of viewpoints that are brought together because it's only through that diversity that we actually understand how everyone gets affected and how we can make changes that are beneficial for everyone. You know, the, the title of, uh, of your book uh, is System Error, which, you know, as soon as I hear that, I think, you know, see a system error, a, a technical issue, uh, but how big tech went wrong. And you also propose, you all also propose, you know, how we can fix this. Uh, but let me start um, a little bit from the perspective of somebody that's just out there uh, walking around, going through life, you know, they got uh, all of these apps on their phone, they, maybe they obviously use Facebook, Twitter, uh, they order online from Amazon, uh, you know, they search on Google, and they mostly see the benefit of big tech. Uh, and they say, look, uh, throughout history, as technology has advanced, you know, when TV came along, there were people who swore up and down that this was going to be the downfall of our society. Uh, and then when cable television came along, even more so, uh, in the early days of the internet, when it became, you know, started to be more widely used, obviously it was different. Uh, and then again, even different more so uh, with the rise of social media, Facebook and Instagram and so forth. Um, why should people be paying attention in their everyday lives to this? Well, one level, the reason why they should be paying attention, this is part of the reason why we wrote the book, is there's a lot of ways the technology affects people's lives that they're not even aware of. Mm -hmm. So these days we have, for example, algorithms that make all kinds of decisions that have consequences that are pretty significant for people's lives. Things like, are you granted credit? Do you get access to certain kinds of health care? Who gets out on bail in the criminal justice system, right? These are things that have significant consequence for people, but oftentimes people don't know that they're being applied or when they, even when they do, they don't know what is their recourse. They don't know what they can do about it. And so those are among the things we talk about is how do you get sensible policies that help people be able to interact with these technologies in a more positive way? So if I have decisions made about me by an algorithm, one, I want to know what's going on. Second, I deserve an explanation as to what it's doing. And third, I still need to have my due process rights to be able to challenge that decision in some meaningful way. But we begin to understand the, the, the tension between when a human makes that decision, we go and revisit it and the human might make a different decision and an algorithm that would always make the decision the same way. And so it's understanding those differences where we can see the, the tensions that arise and what people need to know about the technology and what we can do about it. Can I add just a bit to that? You know, one of the things that you, you so, so aptly described uh, is this, this shifting sentiment in which people are either so joyous about some emerging technology and then at the same time also sometimes so fearful. And Part of the thing, you know, Silicon Valley is in certain respects committed to historical amnesia, re refuses to address the past and what you might learn from it. And part of our book takes a look at um, the history of some emerging technologies and this frequent cycle in which we, you get a sort of early burst of euphoria, a kind of techno optimism about what's possible. And in the early days of the internet, people who thought that, you know, these technical uh, gizmos and gadgets and platforms and the internet were going to unlock human potential and spread freedom across the world. And then you get the backlash and a kind of polar opposite reaction in which, you know, the internet is rotting democracy from within and addicting us to our, to our cell phones. And I think we're about to exit in a, in, a, in a happy way, that era of polarized thinking in which it's either all good or all bad. And we can take 
you know, a more sensible approach, but what I even just call a grown up approach. Uh, we should try our best not to let all of these consequential decisions be made only by people in tech companies, but to make them together and to raise our own voices and allow our democratic institutions to play the role they have historically played in order to you know, be the guardrails for democracy and ensure that the civic interest and the common good is indeed protected and the worst kinds of harms are avoided. And we're about to enter, we think, that moment. And, and the book provides a framework for thinking about exactly that with all kinds of anecdotes and little, you know, small historical lessons thrown in for comparison's sake. And, and you know, y'all do have uh, some very compelling ones, uh, anecdotes, examples, and maybe you could just provide, give us a, a sense of that, the readers, a uh, couple of those. Sure, well, I'll start with one, and I mean, there's lots of them in the book. You know, one of the things which I think is an interesting question is that technologists have, a, have an optimizing approach to what they're doing, and when that, when that optimizing approach gets exported to a kind of worldview rather than just something directed to their technical accomplishments, um, it, it, it leads people often to wonder about the value of democracy itself because democratic institutions are not an optimizing institutional design. They're, they're a framework for fair decision-making that allows the refereeing and balancing of contesting points of view. And so, one of the anecdotes in the book that, you know, sort of arrested my attention when I was at a dinner and the question was, you know, what, what would it be like if we could somehow find a place on earth, a plot of land where we could maximize the progress of science? And people had some conversation about this and that and what kind of plot of land and how would you set it up? And eventually I raised my hand and said, you know, like, I, I just want to get clear here as the political philosopher. Like, is this a democracy we're talking about? Like, what's the governance arrangement here exactly? And the more or less uniform response was immediately from a bunch of technologists. A democracy? Absolutely not. That will hold <laughs> progress back. And the whole point is to maximize the progress. And, you know, that's when it began to register for me. What exactly is the attachment of, of certain kinds of technologists to the value of democracy itself, as broken and dysfunctional as it can be, and in fact, in many respects is, but still we should attach some value to it. And, and sometimes I don't see that. And that's deeply worrisome. Let me share another anecdote, you know, that, that also touches on this question of optimization because central to the argument of the book is that to understand what's playing out with technology, you need to understand the mindset of technologists. And the mindset mm -hmm. of technologists is one that focuses on optimization. And optimization presents for itself a set of challenges. Optimization is a focus on the means rather than the ends. You could optimize for good things or you could optimize for bad things. Optimization also focuses on things that are measurable but may not in fact be meaningful. And, and the process of optimization lifts up some values that get privileged and sets aside other things that we may care about. And we open the book with the story of, of you know, a young founder at Stanford, Joshua Browder, who started a company called Do Not Pay. And Do Not Pay was motivated by something that surely has annoyed lots of people on, on this uh, sort of live chat at some point in their life, which is sometimes you get a parking ticket. And you get a parking ticket because you're rushing around town and you put your car in a place that you're not supposed to put it. And uh, someone comes along, he gives you a parking ticket. And so, you know, as a young Stanford student, he developed a, a, a code and an automated mechanism that would enable anyone to basically contest that parking ticket without needing to go down to the station, without needing uh, to sort of present your case and to take advantage of aspects of the bureaucratic system that simply allowed people who challenged with the right language to get out of paying their parking ticket. Now, we open with that anecdote because it raises all sorts of important questions about, uh, if, you, if you take a moment and think about it, about why do we have parking tickets, right? Um, and, and is it a good thing for society to really enable people to just get out of parking tickets because they have access to an app, right? Why, why might we have parking tickets? Well, we might have parking tickets because we want spaces that are reserved for disabled people to be used by disabled people. Or if you live in a crowded city, you might need street cleaners and they need to be on one side of the street on a particular day or on another side of the street. Or maybe you have a driveway at your house and it actually matters to you to be able to back your car out of your driveway and to take your kids to school in the morning. Yeah. There might even be civic purposes 
for parking tickets, right? You might use parking tickets to reduce congestion in the city, something that the city of London has done, right? Because you care about the environment. And if you dig beneath the surface, you might recognize that parking tickets are actually a critical part of municipal revenue. And so the optimization mindset that's reflected in the creation of a company called Do Not Pay, right, which just enables people to get out of this annoying thing that we have to deal with, which is called a parking ticket, isn't optimizing for society. It's optimizing for individuals. And the central argument of the book is that the design of every new technology involves exactly these kinds of trade-offs. And unless we look beneath the hood and figure out what is it that the technologists and the companies are optimizing for and what other values are put at risk, we actually leave decisions about society in the hands of the technologists and the companies that produce these technologies without engaging them democratically. And, and Jeremy, you, I mean, y'all are you the, basically, you see that same approach of optimizing for the individual over and over and over again as opposed to, but give us uh, the counter example. What would be an example of optimizing for society? Just so people, you know. So I'll start on this, but I'd love Marilyn to jump in too. One of the exercises that we put our undergraduates through uh, in class, because we're, we're challenging them to think not only like technologists, but also like policymakers and like philosophers. We want them to take normative positions about what they value in the world and what values they want reflected in technology because technology is not value neutral. And so one of the exercises that we put them through is to imagine that you were in charge of a news feed, that you had basically built a platform that provided people with access to information. Mm -hmm. Now, if you optimize for something like clicks or time on the platform, you might dial up you know, the interactions that people have with content that is consistent with their prior beliefs or gets them into echo chambers where they hear the same thing over and over again from the like-minded uh, because we understand the human biases that kind of generate that reality. And you can see when you're tuning the knobs on this platform that your revenues are gonna go through the roof. But what if you also think in creating something called the digital public sphere, that you also have a civic purpose that is, you actually want people to be exposed to views that are inconsistent with their own. Why? Because maybe you care about the health of our democracy. And we want our students to grapple with that tension and trade-off and to recognize that in the design of every technology, these choices are being made. And now maybe in a company with the way that companies are constructed and the way that the venture capital industry funds them, it's very hard for C-suite executives to say, we care about the health of our democratic you know, digital public sphere. But I'd say that we're reaching a point in society now that unless companies begin to care about the health of our digital public sphere, you're gonna get a set of guardrails that come from policymakers in Washington that, that really limit the freedom of movement of these companies because of the consequences that we've seen for society. And the pressure won't only come from Washington because one of the sea changes we've seen on campus is that students themselves now feel evident ambivalence about going to work for the big tech companies because the harms produced by technology are visible for everyone to see. And so whereas five years ago, the excitement about going to Facebook and Google was the kind of thing you went home to tell your parents as quickly as the offer came in, we're in a different day and age now. We're in an and you see that, you hear that, and you see it in the student's attitude. Absolutely. Uh, Lord tech. You know, we definitely see it. And there's, you know, I think much to their credit, students are spending more time thinking about these kind of issues. It's part of the reason why the class is popular. It's part of the reason why we felt like we needed to bring these issues to a broader public through the book. Um, you know, we see it in organizations that they're creating, like there's an organization called CS Plus Social Good on campus, where students are specifically looking at how do we try to grapple with these issues. And I think the bigger picture, you know, to the, the question that you brought up is that when we think about these technologies, we think about optimization, we think about AI and machine learning. Really what these things are is providing a mirror to our society. And the mirror says, what are the values you really care about? Because now we're gonna provide you with a method to be able to optimize whatever you say you want to optimize. And the question is, what do you say versus what you want? So, you know, a simple example to kind of show you the, the differences is, you know, on YouTube, for example, one of the things that they want is to maximize the amount of time people watch videos, right? Because then you can show more ads, you generate more revenue. 
But the flip side of that is that means, you know, my kids are spending all their time glued to a screen, yeah. right? Is that what we really yeah. want? Is that what the engineers who develop those algorithms really oh, want? I can vouch for that for my six-year-old son, always on YouTube, yeah, watching. There you go. You know, and so society- and whatever else, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know, some of the stuff actually, you know, you watch over their shoulder and then you get sucked in too. <laughs> then you realize how powerful the algorithms really are. Um, but part of it is what do we really want for a healthy sphere more broadly? And to take this to an even greater extreme, I'll give you a hypothetical, right? Which, which starts with something that sounds good and shows you where optimization can take it. So we have things like speed limits to try to keep roads safe, right? Well, these days with GPS technology, what we could do is we could instrument cars to be able to detect what the speed limit is any place you're driving. And anytime the car goes above that speed limit, it issues you a ticket. And when it issues you enough tickets, it just stops the car from moving and issues a warrant for your arrest and sends out a beacon so the police know where you are. That's extreme efficiency and optimization of this issue around the laws for speed limits. But when we go to that extreme, we essentially end up creating a police state. We get rid of individual autonomy to yep. make choices about when do we actually want to speed because there's some emergency or there's something that's important to us. And so it brings back up that mirror. It says, is this really the society you want? Because we can get you what you say you want. The bigger question now becomes redefining what you want for something that's actually healthy for everyone rather than something that's just easy to measure. And just the well, comment the, at this point, uh, Julian, is just to say that, you know, sometimes you hear from technologists that the technology is value neutral, that, that really the question is sort of how do people use technology? And I think a critical message of the book and part of what we've tried to convey to our students, but the book is really an effort to engage the broader public in, in sort of looking inside these technologies and understanding how the choices are being made is that there's nothing value neutral about these technologies. These technologies reflect the value choices that, that engineers are making and the companies that are backing these engineers. And, and what we need to surface for ourselves is where those value choices are in some way in tension, if they are, with other things that we might care about in society, right? So Maron gave the example of, of algorithmic decision-making and the tension that exists with notions of fairness and due process. Or when you think about the advances with respect to AI and its implications for our workforce, yes, there are potential gains there, enormous gains, but there are also potential costs. And that may be in tension in particular with low-wage workers and their ability to make a living and to provide for their family. And so sometimes the changes that we can make to get the outcomes that we want are in the technologies themselves, but sometimes they're a function of policy. They're a function of how do we mitigate the harms because we want to embrace the benefits of technology. This is not a book about putting technology on ice. This is a book about recognizing that technology isn't value neutral and ensuring that we cultivate a set of ethical technologists and companies that are thinking not only about their corporate bottom line, but about social effects, and then positioning us and our democratic politics to think about what kinds of harms we need to guard against. Uh, and, you know, I'm uh, here in Washington, D.C. tonight. Uh, lucky me, I guess. <laughs> but I think it's fair to say that these days, both on the left and the right, you have, uh, you know, policymakers who have taken aim at Silicon Valley. Um, folks, of course, I'm a big fan of Senator Warren, who has said basically break them up. On the other end, you have Senators Josh Hawley, Senator Ted Cruz, and others who have taken issue with some of the practices of big tech and particularly social media companies. Uh, and that seems to be something that y'all are, are pushing back against and, and instead trying to be prescriptive about how we can find a balance. Talk to me about, you know, what is, what is the approach that you think y'all think that we should, should take? So I think this is a book that, that will help people who want to make sense of this policy landscape understand you know, what appears in the, in, the, in the public debates between the Democrats who are thinking about these issues and the Republicans who are thinking about these issues. But if I were to frame the issues for you at the highest level, uh, it's that right now it's incredibly popular to be against big tech. You're not gonna find a politician, you know, who is enthusiastically embracing big tech at a moment of 
misinformation and disinformation or privacy violations. Um, you know, this is a moment where, where kind of concerns about competition. Everyone feels the potential political win that's associated with challenging concentrated power, uh, whether you're sort of on the right or on the left. I think the big question for us as we look at what's taking place in Washington is, is what's doable given the paralysis of our politics and the polarization of the country. And while the attention uh, in, in, in the newspapers and in the media is on these biggest picture issues like antitrust and content moderation, uh, what you described as, as kind of Warren's set of issues, and, and we've seen great work on the House side, uh, bipartisan work by the House Judiciary Committee investigating competition concerns, but then you know the Hawley concerns and, and other Republicans around content moderation. Those are probably the hardest issues on which to generate bipartisan consensus at the current moment. And so part of what we lay out in the book, and, and we shared some of our thoughts on this in the Atlantic a couple of days ago, we described this as the kind of ongoing race between disruption and democracy, and it's time for democracy to pick up the pace. We talk about how you know, the most important thing that democracy has done historically is identify the kind of most evident harms and set in place guardrails uh, to avoid those harms. Democracy tends to be very good at achieving consensus around a relatively small number of things. And then democracy has to navigate the complexity of disagreement on, on much bigger and broader issues. And so our view is that there are a whole set of things on which we believe both parties ought to be able to act you know, immediately. And that includes privacy and the deep concerns about privacy that are shared in both parties, uh, bringing up to the present an American regulatory framework with respect to meaningful notice and consent so people know what's happening to their personal data. Um, second, bringing transparency and oversight to all of these automated decision-making systems that Maron described. It should not be okay in the United States of America for you to have decisions made that are critical to your life by machines without you being aware of it, without you understanding how machines are making those decisions and with you, without you having recourse. And of course, the third frontier that we think is just absolutely essential for bipartisan agreement is the question of how we are gonna navigate the effects of AI on the future of work. And we know that those effects are gonna be largest for low wage workers, but as we you know, are at pains to communicate to our students all the time, computer programmers are gonna be out of a job you know, if AI continues the pace. And so the challenge for all of us to, to think about our social safety net and how it needs to evolve, but also what it means to invest in upskilling and retraining, these are shared concerns. That's not to say that we don't think the antitrust issues and content moderation issues are extremely important, but I think we expect in the near term that antitrust is something that's gonna play out on the executive branch side alone in the absence of, of kind of strong bipartisan support. Um, and content moderation, the kind of concerns that we're seeing emanating from Washington on this are already generating a massive amount of ferment and change inside the companies themselves. Uh, and ultimately it's gonna be a push and pull among the companies and, and regulators to figure out what's the right way to deal with things like the Communications Decency Act and Section 230 and, and platform immunity. There's not gonna be a single solution to that problem. It's gonna be a mix of what happens on the company side and what ultimately emanates from Washington. Uh, Maron or Rob? I guess I, I, I just want to put things in a, in, a, in a really simple, you know, wrap up a tiny bow on why we think the moment right now is so pregnant with possibility. Um, despite the fact that, as you indicated, you know, different sides of the aisle come to the issue with different motivations. Um, we were aware 18 months ago of all the various concerns that we've just described, misinformation, disinformation, hate speech, concentration of power, data privacy abuses, displacement of work, et cetera, et cetera. And then the pandemic hit. And what happened, of course, in the pandemic is we all became even more dependent upon the digital tools and devices and platforms on which you know, virtually the entirety of our lives have shifted. Work, education, keeping contact with our loved ones. And so the power of the relatively small number of companies has only gotten even greater in the past 18 months. And of course, the market valuations of these big tech firms are through the roof right now, reflecting our greater dependence and use of all of the services. And so the kind of contradictions have never been greater, we think. And there's a moment that we think is emerging where 
Individual users of devices will play a role. Tech workers inside companies will play a role. Policymakers in the states and Washington, D.C., and of course, globally and in the EU and, and the various other uh, policy mechanisms that can be deployed. And we're about to enter this new moment of thinking about countervailing sources of power to the tiny number of people at the moment, primarily here in Silicon Valley and Seattle, who make decisions for billions of people around the world with no opportunity for the rest of us to have a voice. And you can see there's already blueprints in the work for how this thing can happen. So, you know, there's places, you know, like Jeremy was referring to, that the left and right can definitely agree on something and push something forward. Like sensible data privacy legislation is one of those things, right? You have the European Union is already out front there in terms of the general data protection regulation, which codifies some pretty nice rights around individuals in there data that they have and the control they have over it. You know, interestingly enough, China actually just last week announced the set of policies that it's enacting to protect personal data as well. Um, the Cal in California, we have the California Consumer Privacy Act. But I think, in fact, tech companies don't want to see, you know, 50 different pieces of legislation in 50 states, what they'd actually like to see some federal legislation to have sort of a level playing field to make it easier to deal with. And so that's one of the other places I think, you know, in, in terms of we all like to say everyone plays a role. There's times that sometimes you hear the tech sector say, well, we will self-regulate, right? You don't need to worry about us. And my response to that is, well, if you come up with such great ideas for self-regulation, why shouldn't we just codify those as actual regulation to make sure everyone abides by them, right? So I think the notion of self-regulation is a little bit of a red herring. It's something that just says, hands off, we can figure this out ourselves. Really what we wanna think about is what's the set of rules that everyone participates in figuring out what gets set and then codify those so everyone has to participate the same way. And y'all spend a, a good amount of time in talking about the, the importance of strengthening uh, privacy rights, right? As you mentioned, I think you talk about uh, a government agency specifically for uh, protecting consumers' privacy rights, um, uh, boosting informed consent, a number of different, I think, a federal recognition of the right of privacy, which is, you know, fascinating as well with the Supreme Court and the recent uh, non-decision over the Texas uh, anti-abortion legislation, um, because fundamentally that Roe versus Wade was based on a right of privacy that was recognized in 1956 in Griswold versus Connecticut. And so it's a, a, a fascinating time for many reasons to have that conversation. But my question is, I think you're right that um, across the board, whether somebody is uh, liberal, conservative, libertarian, you know, whatever they are, that the idea of privacy is a popular one among just everyday citizens. Why is it, do you think, that more states than California and, and the federal government have not been more aggressive at trying to protect consumers' privacy? Well, maybe to start there on a couple of things. One is I think for a long time, the harms weren't as clear. There wasn't an understanding of how much data was being gathered, how it was being used, and then the potential for privacy breaches, right? So when we get things like Cambridge Analytica and people find that there are you know, records that they may have had in some database or their credit card numbers have been stolen in mass, suddenly they begin to wonder how secure their data is and what are the safeguards for using it? So you know, most people don't read the terms of service for some app or some website when they go there. They just kind of get this, you know, in this notice and consent framework, here are terms of service, 50 pages, you click OK, and you've pretty much given away most of your rights to anything that they want to do with your data. And that just doesn't seem like a very sensible way to go. People should know how their data is being used and have some control over it. And so that's the way we think about guardrails, right? Is we wanna have a system that works for everyone that says these things are things that we can understand easily and then you can still make your choices, but you shouldn't have to swallow sort of whole hog these onerous terms of service that a site gives you. And it's now that we're waking up to exactly what those things are and what, you know, where the breaches in privacy happen that is making us wanna take more action. I just add to that that you know people have basically been told that you know you can't have these products that you really enjoy and care about and have privacy at the same yeah. time. And it doesn't have to be that way. Right? You know, this is where there's a tension between 
what companies are optimizing that serves their own interests and a, a broader value. And the, the regulatory regime that we have in place, which is called notice and consent, right, which basically says that companies need to, you know, truth in advertising, tell you what's going on, and then you consent to use this. You know, you get hundreds of pages of, of forms that no one's going to read through and you accept as quickly as possible when you're going to download an app or, or you consent to this when you sign up to Gmail and, and a set of other Google products. And, and people are left feeling that they absolutely have no agency in this situation, like, you know, if, if you want to use this technology, you can't care about privacy at all. Um, that calls for, you know, an exploration of not only state level action, like we have with the CCPA in California, or a federal role, uh, you know, as we've seen in other countries, to help people realize their proper, their privacy rights. Because we know people care about privacy. The reality is they have a hard time acting on their privacy concerns. And part of that is the whole setup is constructed so that you're forced to choose between something that's good in various ways in your life and something else that you care about. And, and the trade-off doesn't need to be black or white in the way that it's been set up uh, for consumers in this country. Yeah. Uh, Rob, did you have anything uh, on that one? And then I know we're going to go to audience questions in a moment. Yeah, let's go to audience questions. It's time to get people, other people's voices. Terrific. In. All right, let me see if I can use this technology. <laughs> well, okay. Uh, our first question is from uh, Julia, who asks, uh, as technology becomes more sophisticated, streamlined, and integrated, there's a greater divide between the lives and experiences of those with access to it and those without. In your opinion, what technological innovation is doing the quote, most good for the most people and what technological innovation is serving a privileged few while locking others out? Thank you for the question, Julia. And I'll open that up to, to any of y'all that want to answer. That. Let me start there. I and mean, it's a, that's a great question. And, and as, as Jeremy already noted, the book opens with this very short contrasting portrait of a young technologist at Stanford named Joshua Browder, who creates this do not pay way of getting out of paying park a ticket, parking tickets. And another Stanford dropout from a slightly earlier generation named Aaron Swartz. And Aaron Swartz also acquired the same technical skills that are on offer um, for a C computer science major. But instead of thinking that the obvious thing to do with those technical skills was to get a bunch of venture capitalists to invest in the company that would then create some sort of product and you could as quickly as possible bring it to scale, Aaron Swartz was a civic technologist. And he thought that what made these technical skills valuable was that you could to try to deploy them on behalf of the interests of many, many people to help coordinate their activities for some civic or political end. Mm. And that gets what, to my mind, to what Julia's excellent question is about. When the, when the seeming model for an average 20 year old um, who thinks, what can I do to make a difference in the world is to get a bunch of technical skills and to go off to Silicon Valley, um, that's one, one important path, but hardly the only one. And there are, are, and there should be many more examples of what you could call civic technologists. And the book ends with one present today that very few people know about, but deserve attention. It's the, the digital minister of Taiwan named Audrey Tang, who has used digital devices, digital platforms, all kinds of ways of facilitating citizen voice through digital technologies and uh, digital media um, to strengthen democratic institutions rather than to use those technologies on one by one in, you know, to assist people as customers or clients. And of course, we all know that old adage about Silicon Valley, that if you're not paying for the product, you are the product. Mm -hmm. So it's not even strictly speaking correct to say to the average user, you are the, you are the customer. No, no, you're what's being sold to the advertiser. That's not the only path you need to take. And we hope to revive a kind of, you know, alternative pantheon of heroes for young technologists that illuminate this civic technologist route rather than just the, I'd like to have a unicorn and become rich. To add to that, I'd say, you know, it's difficult to pinpoint one technology that is doing the most good for the most people. But I think a fundamental question is who has access, who builds and who are they building for? 
right? And so when we think about, for example, greater diversity in the field, greater educational opportunities, informing more people to be able to come in and have a voice, that's the way where we get technology to work for more people. And so for too long, what we've had is a small group of people in a rel relatively narrow slice making the decisions about what technology gets built, often for people who are like them, right? And so if we want to be able to have more access, this also gets into places where government regulation can play a role. How do we allow for getting basic technology into the hands of more people, creating for digital literacy so they know how to use it, and then creating systems that actually allow them to engage with things that are meaningful to them? Like one simple example would be getting government services, right? And so there's lots of things we could think of that this system could actually be optimized, but could be optimized in a way that's leading to better outcomes for everyone involved, rather than picking some narrow slice. Just to give you a simple example, a friend of mine who worked in venture capital for years said, you know, we have too many companies whose only job is delivering lunches to other startup companies. And if you think about that, right, it's a very narrow demographic that's building things for that same narrow, narrow demographic. They're putting technological resources behind it, they're putting funding behind it, but the vast majority of people don't see any benefit. Okay. Someone asked, uh, I'd love to hear more about the distinctions between the optimizing for the individual thinking of technologists versus the invisible hand idea of free markets, or even the idea that democracies are aggregations of individual decisions slash choices. Why are these so different and even in opposition? It seems like the latter two, markets and democracy, are ideals based on individual choice decisions that generate social good. They put parenthetically in principle, sometimes in practice, while you believe the technologist version inherently generates negative social consequences. They say, looking forward to reading the book. Uh, yes, yeah, so, I mean, I guess, what yeah. about that, this idea that, you know, does it always generate or usually generate negative social consequences, this, this usual technologist approach? It's such a fabulous question, and I wish this anonymous attendee could join us in seminar to dig really deep on the on the questions that they've raised. You know, this is exactly the kind of, of thinking that we want people to be doing about Silicon Valley and, and the embeddedness of Silicon Valley in our, our economic system and our political culture. Um, obviously, one of the things that's prized in our society and many others is liberty, right? Is individual choice, is the idea that people have preferences and they have freedom to choose what they wanna purchase and where they wanna live. Uh, and they can express those preferences, not only with respect to their own sort of world around them, but to the kind of world that they wanna live in more broadly. But, but the two things that I wanna say about, about the, the question raised by the questioner, number one, um, for markets to function, you need a set of guardrails in place. And so we, we have to recognize that, that these notions of a free market that are simply the result of the aggregation of individual choice, simply forget the fact that things like property rights and underlying rules of regulation to provide for fair competition, these are the things that enable our market to be such a powerful driver of innovation. And so to think that, that our market system isn't deeply embedded with the regulatory state is, is to misread the reality of our free market system in the United States and any other free markets in the world that are really undergirded by a set of rules that are decided upon by democracy. And then the second point just to make is that, you know, we describe in the book democracy as a technology. And what we mean when we call democracy a technology is it's basically the set of procedures that we've invented as a society for dealing with profound disagreement among individuals with respect to how they want to be governed. Now, is it the most efficient system? As Rob said earlier, it, it may not be the most efficient system, like a, a good dictator or, or king would make a decision far more quickly. Uh, but if you value people's right to disagree with one another, and you have a kind of guiding assumption that the best way to maintain peaceful and cooperative relations in society is to try and generate consensus and agreement, democracy is what we've arrived at. And so democracy, yes, it allows for individual choice. It allows for the individual expression of preferences, but we all submit ourselves in a democracy to the decisions made by those we elect to make choices for us and to be informed. And the power that we reserve for ourselves 
is the power to throw the bums out, uh, not to, to get everything that we want as an individual. And so I think when people hear criticism of regulation or criticism of democracy and its role in big tech, you have to recognize that this criticism of regulation or the idea of guardrails is in essence an argument that we should leave the decision-making about our collective goals in the hands of companies or in the hands of technologists alone. It's a disparaging of the value of democracy. And I think our view is that it's not acceptable and it's especially not acceptable now that the harms are so evident for everyone to see. We know what outcomes are generated if we don't engage democratically on these issues. So yes, a voice for individuals, but individuals have to make compromises. And that's what it means to live in, in a community together. Great. I'll, a, uh, oh, go, go ahead. ahead. No, I was just gonna say, there's also a simple example. There's you know clay cases that are backed by data that show where sort of societal preferences and market preferences of individuals dif dif diverge. Right? And the simple one is if we kind of think about automation as self-driving cars. A lot of people say, you know, I would like to have cars that try to maximize for, uh, you know, people's safety overall. And then when you ask them, so if you were going to buy a car yourself, do you want the car to maximize your safety as a passenger or everyone's safety? And they say my safety as a passenger. So their personal preference for the kind of car they would buy in a free market is different than what even they themselves would like to see happen societally. Wow. All right. This next question is a good one. It's time to kind of zero in on and name names. What tech companies are practicing ethical tech and data well? So I would answer that, maybe take a more broader approach, which is to say that most tech companies don't necessarily operate as monoliths. They actually don't. They have different groups that look at different kinds of things. And so I can give you one example of a company that does an example of things it does well and some things it doesn't do so well. So Amazon.com, for example, had built a system to screen resumes uh, to determine who gets job interviews. That's one of the most technologically sophisticated companies in the world. They found that that resume screening system was biased against women. It would find particular words like the term women or the name of all women's colleges and resumes and actually downweight them as a result. But they found this out because they did an audit internally to see how it worked. They tried to fix the system and they ultimately couldn't, so they scrapped it. That's actually an example of the notion of audits and transparency working because that group took the time to actually be able to figure out what was going on with that system before they deployed it and have it start making a bunch of decisions in the world. At the same time, Amazon has other problems with you know, the kinds of competition they have, what sort of data they gather about uh, products that are sold and then decide to implement a competing product or to release a competing product. So even within the same large company, you can have good practices and bad practices. It's a matter of identifying the good ones and promoting those and finding guardrails against the bad ones. All right, and we have uh, time for one final question, Brad tells me. And uh, maybe Rob will ask you to, to take this one. Uh, Lisa says, love the book. From the start of your work on this book to the end, which of your views regarding the impact of technology on society changed the most and which of them was the most solidified? Right. Um, I love the question because one of the great pleasures of being able to teach and then to think and write a book together is that it's not as if all of my views were formed and you know solid mm -hmm. and I knew exactly what I thought beforehand. I, I learned along the way. And uh, which it was the most solidified. So, so this one for sure, the idea that a, a technologist has what I just call a kind of this optimizing mindset, which is really just concerned with the consequences of that happens. Like, does the code work or does it not work? Does the, does the product reach scale or not? What are the metrics? We've got to measure it. It's all quantifiable. And yet there's this very strange simultaneous orientation, which has always puzzled me that has gotten solidified, which is you hear people in tech companies say all the time when they, they are told there are all these negative consequences, these harms, they'll say, oh, but those are unintended consequences. Um, no one was a malevolent person inside the company. We're trying to do good. We just didn't, we weren't just foreseeing in order to account for these consequences. But the person who only cares about the consequences, it doesn't really matter what your intentions were. Like right now with the withdrawal from Afghanistan, I think it, it might be a fair thing to say, 
There are a whole bunch of unintended consequences going on right now in Afghanistan that certainly no one intended to bring about. And yet the idea that anyone who says they're unintended, we should just let them off the hook entirely. No accountability necessary. You don't need to ask any more questions. Would seem preposterous in politics. But yet that's what Silicon Valley gets away with all the time. It's time to end that. All right. What have I, what, what, what impact um, about technology has changed the most for me? Well, you know, here I think the, the idea that I've learned through the collaboration is, you know, there's a temptation for the philosopher to think that, that ethics is a kind of shining path forward. If only we had virtuous people, virtuous companies, a virtuous society, um, then it would sort of handle things on its own. Philosophers have only one piece of the puzzle and um, whatever, whatever confidence I had about the philosopher's contribution really was, um, was limited or constrained by learning how extraordinary the technical skills and the history of computer science, a relatively young discipline compared for sure to philosophy and the necessity of consulting policymakers and social scientists. So let's we'll just take misinformation and disinformation. We hear all the time about echo chambers. That's not a question that you can resolve at the level of principle or some abstract theory. You got to consult the, the evidence. Well, is there more information, misinformation circulating now than there was prior to the internet? That's not a, a philosophical question. That's a social science question. And so I could be an armchair so, social scientist, which is to say a useless social scientist. You got to consult the social scientist in order to get a good answer to that question. Well, uh, Rob, uh, Marad, and Jeremy, uh, felicidades, congratulations. Thank you. On the publication of System Error, uh, which is a powerful and important timely book. Uh, it, it actually feels like a public service that y'all have done uh, for all of us and encourage everyone to pick up a copy. And with that, thank you. I'm gonna turn it back over to Brad. No, an hour is just nowhere near enough to address all these issues. I don't even know if a whole, a whole uh, semester is, is enough. You know, great moderating, Julian and, and Rob and Maron and Jeremy, you know, as much as, uh, as many of us would like, we all can't come out to Stanford to take your groundbreaking course, but, but now at least by reading your book, we can get the benefit of all the, uh, all the great thought you put into how to reconcile big tech with, with democratic values. Uh, to everyone watching, thanks for tuning in. A reminder that uh, in the chat column, you can find a link for purchasing copies of uh, System Error. From all of us here at Politics and Prose, stay well and well read. Thank you.